Hi, everybody out there. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I'm Richie Yuhiko. I'm the Managing Librarian for Young Adult Services at the Mid-Manhattan Library of the New York Public Library. And I'm so lucky to talk to author and creative extraordinaire Nick Stone today. So Nick's new book is Shuri, a Black Panther novel. Shuri, if you don't know, is a genius young scientist and the Wakandan princess. She's so brilliant that she's the mastermind behind the Black Panther's vibranium suit and the inventor of much of the tech in the highly advanced nation. This Black Panther novel follows a moment in Shuri's life where she must save her country from the impending doom that no one seems to quite take seriously. Not her big headed brother, King T'Challa, her mother or the other elders. And for centuries, the Black Panther has gained his powers through the juices of the heart-shaped herb, which is essential to the survival and prosperity of Wakanda. But something is wrong and the plants are dying. It's up to Shuri to travel from Wakanda to discover what is killing the herb, how she could save it in this first volume of this all new original adventure. And of course, even though we are closed, that doesn't mean we can't bring the book to you. If you have your library card, the ebook and audiobook is available on our ebook platform, Simply E. And if you haven't already yet, you could get your library card by downloading that app and signing up. So before I get started with Nick, there are just a few housekeeping items I have to go over. This event is being simulcast on Zoom and YouTube. If you encounter any technical, di technical difficulties during the conversation, please bear with us. We'll sort it out as quickly as possible. I should also tell you that the event is being recorded, not only my, but only myself and Nick are being recorded, not the attendees, which is to say not you. But you could, of course, close out of Zoom or close the YouTube page at any time and we'll miss you. Um, Nick also really wants to answer your questions today, especially that of young people. You can definitely send them to her at any time during the conversation. If you have a question, please type it at any point into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the Zoom app. We'll make sure that Nick sees them, though she may not have time to answer everything. And we'll go through the Q&A at the end of the discussion today. So without further ado, welcome Nick. Welcome you to oh Wakanda. <laughs> yes. That is amazing. You know, I what? had to no. bring you on in over here. <laughs> the, tech is, the tech is amazing, I promise. Oh, you were incredible. Thank you <laughs> for doing that. I could just, this is, this is just the end of it. We don't even have to just, we could just look at you in the background and the makeup and everything. That is incredible. <laughs> oh my God. So welcome. Welcome. Thank um, you. Is there anything that I missed um, about the summary of this story without spoiling everything, uh, anything? No, not really. I mean, you're right. She's, she seems to be the only one that cares about this. She's like, this is a huge deal. And nobody seems to be paying attention because they're all worried about challenge day, which anybody who has seen the film is familiar with. It's that tradition in Wakanda where people can come and challenge T'Challa for the throne and the mantle of Black Panther. So because everybody's so hyper-focused on that. There's this other stuff going on. And Sheree's like, yo, can we get a little attention over here? Cause you know, this herb is dying. It's important. I mean, it, it fuels basically the super, the super strength, the powers of the Black Panther, right? Um, and without yeah. it, you know, they're just, it's just technology and the training and the smarts, which is not nothing, obviously. Right. You know, yeah, there's but, a line where she says, um, you know, without the juices of the herb, the Black Panther is, is just a dude in a stretchy suit. And it's, <laughs> it's not untrue. Um, I mean, she's, she also spends a lot of her time in the book trying to look for the right fabric and stuff to make uh, out of the Black Panther suit that uh, her brother, her big headed brother is requesting. So I'm glad you mentioned the movie because that is the background from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It is. But the book is not in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, correct? It is not. So the, it, this was the most interesting thing about, the most interesting thing for me about this project was having to come to it knowing that most people who come to read it will solely be familiar with the movie. Um, it's a book for middle readers, technically, like she's 13 in the book. So it's aimed at like 
age 10 to a thousand really, but <laughs> knowing that there will be small children who read the book, they're not reading the Black Panther comics. The Black Panther comics are a little out of their league. I think mm-hmm. when you're like 10 or 11, they're, they're heavier, they're older, uh, definitely aimed at like more of an adult audience. Mm-hmm. So I had to figure out how I was going to build this world that people are familiar with from a film without actually using the elements of the film. Because the film is is Ryan Coogler's intellectual property. So like, there was <laughs> stuff that I just couldn't do. It was fascinating. It was, it was quite a ride to say the least. Well, I was gonna ask you, um, you know, what what is the difference, right? So you, so you've written Odd One Out, you've uh, written Dear Martin, both books that are very near and dear to to my heart as well. Um, so you've created these original, vibrant characters before, um, but what about what was different? You're talking about creating a world that people already know. Yeah. What was different about that? What was different about that process? What's fascinating about creating, or I should say even, because I really didn't create much of anything. It was more like moving through a world Hmm. people are honestly not as familiar with as they think. And so as I am moving through creating this space and kind of augmenting what people already think they know about Wakanda. There was a lot of like me asking questions that I didn't have answers to, you know, like where exactly is the palace situated in the city? How far is Shuri's lab from the palace? There's that we talk about like the sacred mound where all of the, where all of the vibranium is kept. How far is that from the palace? So like things like distance were really interesting um, picking through. And then even the palace's layout itself. It's funny, I'm working on something else in this world wink, wink. Um, (laughs) And one of the critiques in the draft that I turned in was that they wanted more world building inside the palace. So like maybe we'll create a map so that we see what the Wakandan layout is, like what the the palace's layout is like. Um, Because with world building, what I have discovered even as a creator is that I'm really just giving snippets and then it's up to the reader to kind of fill in the rest with their imagination. And that is real tricky. Like, especially with a place like Wakanda, when we all have these kind of separate conceptions of what the place is like. Right. Um, but I had a blast writing in the world. And I will continue to have a blast writing in the world. Again, wink, wink. Wink, 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 wink. Is that something you can say officially to us? Or you're just, you're just going to leave what it as I a wink? Say, what I say to people, I'm like, just go check Target's website. If you put like Shuri book in Target's website, <laughs> more than one thing pops up. Okay. Okay. I, I, I will do that because I have not done that. And I, I, by the way, I'm an avid Target shopper. Not to plug it or anything. Oh, so I, I was... <laughs> like, um, okay. Uh, well, so... You're talking about this world that people, again, have already conceptualized. Um, did you, you're ta- and you're talking about maybe having a map. I, when I, I noticed when you were reading, uh, when I was reading it and I just finished it a couple of days ago, um, you know, you have this, it was really intriguing to be like, okay, like she was going here, she was going there. Did you have that map set out for yourself before you do that? Is that part of your writing process? I did actually. So what's interesting is that with with this with this original Shuri book, I needed to know where Wakanda was because it's yeah. like I need to be able to map out there's so much science in this book and I know how we science geeks are like I am a massive science geek and I know how we are about like wanting things to be accurate. So like if I mm-hmm. say this, this place is 300 kilometers from x y or z i need to know what my starting point is so and how many seconds maps, it'll take and how many se- exactly like i need to know what is the velocity of her vehicle <laughs> that she's going to be traveling in so i know exactly how long it's going to take her to reach her destination and i can put that in the book um there are maps there are like hand-drawn maps in the hardcover and i kind of pushed a little bit for those to be in there because i think that when we think of wakanda we don't actually know where it is and it's kind of in this little it's in this little part of east africa Mm -hmm. that's near ethiopia and kenya and eritrea and like uganda and it's like in that region but it's surrounded by like five other i think it's five other little tiny fictional nations Mm -hmm. that all they pop up in the marvel canon and so it was really fun um 
writing about this imaginary chunk of Africa that could totally exist. I mean, just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly I'm here. So yeah, I, I, no doubt about it. You're there. You're just blending right into it. I'm, I'm feeling kind of, kind of jipped because I downloaded the ebook and I don't have those, I don't have those maps in my ebook copy. Oh, you gotta get, yeah, I'm <laughs> I got to get, get them it. to you. I'll get them yes. to you. You got to see, they're so beautiful, right? So like yeah. in the next one, um, we're, I think we're going to do a map of the, ooh, ooh, I just said something. She just, said, uh, hmm. said the next one. We're going to do a map recorded. of the palace. <laughs> God, they're going to kill me. A map of the palace. <laughs> and then I'm trying to get them to do a map of another very prominent place in that I'm looking around for my iPad. I wish I had it down here because I would totally show you. I drew a map of something <laughs> that's in the next book and I would show it to you if my iPad was down here, but it's probably good that it's not because I don't want to get murdered. It's not a, it's not a Wakanda either. And that's the reason why it's not right. around you because it's, it's not. not it, right, I left it in where it is, which is not Wakanda right now. <laughs> I, you know, did you get there by social distancing is the next question, you know, oh, I we don't you... have COVID here. It's not a thing. Okay. So the tech, the tech like made sure that COVID was not there. Good. Absolutely. Great. Well, yeah. I... <laughs> there's like nanites and stuff like that heal and get rid of that kind of thing. Well, I was gonna, I actually, um, you know, when you first posted, when you talked about the uh, event on your Instagram, you know, I got really excited. I was like, Oh, but wait, like what would happen if, you know, how would Wakanda and Shuri, you know, as a tech genius and as a advanced uh, country, how would they deal with the pandemic? How do you think? Certainly not the way we did here in America. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, you know, I think, I think it's interesting. I am not going to go too deep into this because I'm sure there are like small children watching and this will go whoop, right over their heads. <laughs> But the way that we handled it says a lot about the way that we think of other human beings in this country. And I think that like, if this had taken place in Wakanda, which clearly it won't because the, they can't get past the dome, it's just not gonna happen. Yeah. Um, but if this was a thing that had taken place in Wakanda, I think it would have been stopped like pretty early on, uh, just because I don't necessarily think that Wakandans would have a problem with social distancing and like having to stay inside for a minute. and. They wouldn't be protesting in the streets because they can't go bowling. Like they're just certain things <laughs> that Wakandans are just not going to do. I'm just going to leave that there. I wonder if there's maybe in your Wakanda, when you write the, write the next one, the next one that, you know, we're not really talking about, there could be a bowling alley. You think there would be a bowling alley? In you the, know what? In that palace? would be kind of fun. And now when one appears, you'll know where it came from. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, do it. I'll do it. And I'll, Ooh, no. Shh. It might not land in this, the one that's being edited, but it might land in another one. Oh my God, it's being edited already? I, oh yeah. We're just, yeah. we're, we're laying out the spoilers here, folks. We're laying Sorry, out the friends. <laughs> not that you're disappointed. I hope you're actually excited. <laughs> that's the hope. Okay, so it is a far cry from the realistic fiction that you've done the so-called um you wrote issue books that you usually write um mm -hmm. what was it like to write the sci-fi behind it right what was it like to get in the mindset is it your first sci-fi sort of iteration it was awesome <laughs> like <laughs> getting to step away from racism for a second i was like this <laughs> this is what fiction is like i just had this moment where i was like Oh, you mean I don't have to write about police brutality or white supremacy or all of these other things that just aren't an issue in Wakanda, you know? Like, mm -hmm. and, and I will say there is something really powerful about getting to write for a younger audience in this space. Um, so I got to be a little bit more playful. There actually is a social issue addressed lightly in this book. Very, and we want to very lightly. Very, I was like, I saw on, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's climate change. So like the one in this book is like low key, super low key climate change. And there of course will be a social issue in every book because I don't know that I know how to not write about social issues. Well, it's writing, just getting to do yeah. it in a different way where I don't mm -hmm. actually have to like research news articles and face these really terrible things that are happening around me all the time. Um, that was great. I have written before um, kind of a speculative contemporary 
fantasy type thing that is on Wattpad friends. So if what? you are interested, <laughs> feel free to check out. I am at the actual Nick Stone on Wattpad and I'm like, I'm verified there. So you'll know that it is me. It's called Little Spark. And I had an eighth grader last year convince me that I needed to just put my first ever novel on Wattpad. So I did. And I think I have like three or four chapters left. I've been posting a chapter a day for the past month and a half. Um, so yeah, there it is. If you want to read Nick's first ever attempt at writing a novel, go for it. You just like made my heart like soar a little bit yeah. right now. You just made my you entire know. week. It and is you know, 100% a first novel. So just keep your expectations <laughs> low is all I'm going to say. I mean, as many Wattpad novels are, right? You yeah. know, I mean, that's what it's there for. You know, it certainly doesn't have to be this polished piece of work, you know, and it's there that you can post chapter by chapter and stuff. So definitely for all our young people out in Wattpad, I definitely know that there are many of the teens that come to the library, they are on Wattpad and stuff. And, you know, we sometimes do like create your own book cover for Wattpad in our activities, yeah. <laughs> you know, so just so you know, Nick Stone is on it as the actual Nick Stone. Okay, yep. verified. I wrote that down. And yep. we're going to be posting. <laughs> Y'all come through. Come peep. Check me out on Wattpad. Add the comments and, and like and favorite. Yes. <laughs> we always and need the followers. There's some stuff I'm reading that I'm like, oh, oh. Like, there's just so much really good. It's interesting, right? So, I, and I say this as, obviously, as a published author, as a bestseller, whatever, whatever. We do too much kind of discrediting of, of early work. And mm -hmm. I, I think that, like, something not being published by a traditional publisher doesn't make it invalid. So yeah. like, I'm a huge fan of Wattpad. Those of you who are aspiring writers, go on there, connect with other writers. It's actually a really great place to just kind of find your, your writing tribe. I love it. I mean, and also it's like, you know, you don't know how your work can improve without comments, right? You yeah. know, without feedback. And that is a great place to start and it's free and it's awesome. Um, so thank you for that, for shouting out your own work. Um, <laughs> um, and you know what, you know, you, you mentioned bestselling is not, um, that's not something to, to snooze on, you know, so definitely always, and this is something that I think I always want to emphasize, you know, as a teen librarian to our kids, like applaud yourself. Right. And, and okay. You know, yeah. So thank you for being a good <laughs> example on that. Pat yourself on the back and, and, and pat yourself on the back for good things that you do. Thank um, you. So, and of course, as a fan, I follow you on Goodreads. Um, and <laughs> uh, so I got your letter on Goodreads and I did want to read a. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did want to read a portion that really felt, um, you know, it, it really felt very moving to me. Um, so you wrote when the book was published and released, Sh Shuri, the genius little sister of T'Challa, the Black Panther, represents everything I was at age 13. A science-obsessed Black girl struggling to figure out, why my figure out my place in the world. But the true beauty of this project was that I got to celebrate those things, validate them. I got to write a girl like me as a savior of a nation. So can you talk to us a little bit more about yeah. that and how it felt when you were called to write about Shuri? I can't cry because like, this is like $50 mascara. Like, give me a second. Um, it's, it's not waterproof if it's $50 mascara. I mean, it is, but you just never know. Like the waterworks start and it all just goes away. Um, so I was, when I, in seventh grade, my favorite book was Michael Crichton's Sphere. Um, that's S-P-H-E-R-E. Mm -hmm. And I was utterly obsessed with black holes. Like that was like seventh grade Nick. I was also like <laughs> on the debate team. And like, it's funny because people meet me now and they're like, well, there's no way you were a nerd. Like you have no idea. Oh, what? <laughs> but it's interesting because I got clowned for it so much. Like I grew up at a time when it wasn't quite cool mm -hmm. to be 
super, super smart. And I, I yeah. think honestly, I can't say that that's still the case today because I'm not in middle or I'm not like living a day-to-day -day life in a middle or a high school, but right. getting to celebrate a love of science, a love of technology. I don't, if you had tapped me on the shoulder 10 years ago and been like, yo, one day you're going to write a book about literally the smartest person on earth. Um, and she's amazing. And you're going to be the person who gets to write her story. I'd have been like, okay, but stop like trying to punk me. Cause punked, I think was still on the air back then. It'd be like, where is Aston Kutcher? Like something's not okay. Here. You're dating yourself there at that I, point. You're, it's you're fine. Yeah. I will be 35 <laughs> in July and I'm proud of what? it. It's fine. Happy early like, birthday. Black don't crack. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but yeah, so getting to write this amazing story about really myself, you know? I don't have access to vibranium, sadly. Man, would life be different if I did? But Shuri loves experimentation and she loves science and she loves reading and she loves knowledge and she loves things that she doesn't know because those are just things that she has an opportunity to learn and having a book that celebrates that in a black girl mm -hmm. i think is a really powerful thing and i'm hoping that all my little science obsessed black girls specifically they get this book and they see themselves and they're like oh yeah, I can be the next Mae Jemison. I can go out here and completely flip the world upside down. I can go into neuroscience. I can decide I want to be an electrical engineer. I can build the next big tech company. I just want that to be validated, um, especially inside kids of color. And I think you you do an excellent job of it, by the way, in this story and, and, and for validating all of that. And you know, you're talking about how it it wasn't cool back then. I'm, I'm just like a smidgen younger than you are, an Asian, don't raisin. Um, hey. <laughs> um, you know, I but, love it. <laughs> when, <laughs> you know, when when we were growing up, right? There weren't it, there weren't a lot of examples of people of color, much less a black person, as as smart and cool, right? We had Urkel, right? That was oh. that was it. Uh. You know, and I'm dating myself right here, you know, and it, it wasn't a cool thing, you know, you still have this like nerd thing going on, you know, but Shuri here is just this incredible person who saves her nation, even though she's not being taken seriously, um, even though she's not the big king of Wakanda, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's really great because even though she's not this big king, she's this integral part of saving yes. the nation right and she's the one that makes it possible for t'challa to perform with his suit right um he has a wedgie without her right and that's no no bueno in the in fighting you don't no, want to you don't want a wedgie i don't know that i want to try a roundhouse kick with a wedgie it's just no. not a thing i want to do no um <laughs> you know so Throughout the story as well, you make no like you really it's not it's not overdone or it's perfect because you're going through and she's noticing all the absence of strong women characters throughout the mm -hmm. story, like that are that are being recognized. You know, um, she's like, Well, why isn't it that they're the princesses are being recognized? Why is it always the king that's the Black Panther? Um, you know, why isn't the Dora Milaje the the primary focus even though they're the strongest army out there mm -hmm. you know how important was it for you to make it that a uh, focus in the story listen i in my research right so i basically got to spend like a few months literally watching movies and reading comics like that was that was the research process Perfect. for writing this book and i'm like how do i do this all the time like let's do this job <laughs> um but it's what's fascinating is there is there is evidence of one female black panther and she wasn't black panther for very long um and i think that it's fascinating you have this country that supposedly sets women up so high right mm -hmm. like they're fiercest, strongest warriors are all women, but there's never really been a, a female ruler. And, and Shuri, so there's a scene in the book where Shuri is getting her hair braided 
and she notices up on the wall, she's in the queen's chambers, in the queen's dressing chambers, and she notices up on the wall, there are these portraits of all of the Wakandan queens. Mm -hmm. And she mentions T'Challa's birth mother, like they don't have the same birth mother. Um, Naomi was T'Challa's birth mother, and she was like the minister of science before she married the king and suddenly became the you wife, know, baby the mama, mama. right? Yeah. Like now, yeah. now I'm the queen and I didn't have this kid. And Shuri questions like, well, what happened to her life after that? Like, did she continue in her scientific pursuits? And I think to me, this was a really important theme to touch on because I find that like, while there are programs and things that are making more space for women and for girls, women and girls aren't necessarily celebrated in those mm. spaces. So it's like, okay, here, we'll give you this little seat at the table, but then we're gonna act like you're not here or we're gonna treat you poorly. Um, and I, I really wanted to touch on that a little bit and, and think a little bit deeper about, you know, even in this country that's so technologically advanced and so big and powerful, like patriarchy is still a thing. Yeah. And so Shuri is, in this first book, she's really trying to figure out her place. Like, what is my role? <laughs> here exactly um how how do i make my mark on this place like i'm just as much a child of t'chaka as t'challa was and if something happens to t'challa i'm gonna have to rule because she's first in line to the throne so she's grappling with all of these questions and she is just not okay with the way she's dismissed and i think my goal with that was to empower young women to be less okay with being dismissed. I, I want young women to understand that like, yes, take up space. You don't have to ask permission to use your voice. Like say what you have to say, do what you have to do and don't allow yourself to be dismissed. Um, and she, she, you know, she had to kind of go around to solve the problem in order for people to recognize, oh wait. But I, I think that initiative is important. And sometimes it's, we just got to do what we got to do. You know, and it, in particular, it's, it's as a, for young people, right? They have that added layer of also not being taken seriously because mm -hmm. they're young, right? So she, and she definitely navigates that. She ends up kicking butt uh, and, and saving the world or saving at least, you know, um, her part of the world for now. Yeah. You know, spoilers, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, so thank you for that. And I did want to ask a little bit, something personal. Yeah. You're a Slytherin. Oh yeah. Like <laughs> hardcore. I have, I have Snape's Patronus tattooed on my forearm. What? Oh yeah. That's amazing. Uh, what? Okay. So did you think that you were a Slytherin because of the Pottermore test or did you just proclaim it for yourself? I mean, it started with the Pottermore test more or less. Like there were certain things that I just couldn't, I couldn't get, oh, you can't see it because Wakanda doesn't want to let me be great, but you can kind of get a glimpse there. <laughs> yes. um, so I, there were, I have always had a strange thing for Severus Snape. Um, <laughs> it's weird admitting that aloud. And like, I will say there were here points, first folks, you heard right. Here there first. were, there were definitely points in reading the series where I didn't like him very much. Um, but I don't know. I think the fact that Snape was always just kind of aggressively himself mm -hmm. was something that got, that moved me as a young person. Cause I was like 12 when the first Harry Potter book came out. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading these books and I'm in this world. I'm like existing in this space where like, I'm, nine times out of 10, the only black kid in the classroom. Um, so reading this character who like wasn't the best character, I mean, I've always had a thing for anti-heroes in general, um, but reading about this character who like was a jerk for most of the series, but never stopped being a jerk. Like there was something really endearing to me <laughs> about that. Like I liked, I liked the fact that like, he was so unmoved by everything and everyone. It was just like, I'm a do me and you, are a little punk. And sometimes he was right. Harry was kind of being a little punk, right? So like it, it was- yeah, Harry it in was general was a punk. No. Yeah, Harry in general, look, we're not, let, let me, let's not like- That's not up for debate. kids' souls. But we're, but we're not gonna yeah. like scorch the children because I don't think they're ready to admit it 
yet. That <laughs> That's true. Their hero. Anyway, um, he, he's so, a hero, but he's still a punk. Like it's he's it, a he is. you have layers to he's, take care of. You know, I'm like you know what? You're right. Being a hero and being a punk are not mutually exclusive. That's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, there was something about the wit and like it's like it's only evil if you use it for bad things. Yeah. Right. It's how I always felt about it. I'm like, you guys are like kind of slick, like it's good to be a little bit slick. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you slick people get stuff done. So I, yeah, I have always identified a little bit um, more with like the darker side of things, no matter what the universe, like Loki is Bay. Like I, who, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, he's about himself, you know? Exactly, exactly. And yes, there are times of course, when that's like not a good thing, but then at other times when you see this, I don't know. It's like they represent like raw humanity to me. Yeah. And I think that raw humanity is something we don't give enough space. Yeah. Um, like we don't give enough space for people to just kind of be trash. But at the end of the day, I think if you strip everything away, we are all pretty much trash. Like we have to be conditioned to actually be kind to each other. And I say that as a mother of two children, <laughs> when children are small, they don't care about no. anything that you no. think or say or feel and you condition them to start caring. Like, I think they develop a little bit more where they start caring a little bit more, but like, have you hung out with a baby? They're <laughs> yeah. the worst. They're like, yeah. <laughs> it's like raw humanity. After they get past the, the really cute, you know, stage. And then all of a sudden they learn to talk and you're like, Oh, 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 <laughs> well, you know, and also, yeah when you give nuance to characters it also I feel like gives us a chance to sort of let go of like these high expectations that we put on ourselves too you know and like we are yeah. we are layered people everybody makes mistakes you know everybody yes. does including Shuri man she messes up a few times and it's yep. always fun to watch <laughs> it is redeeming all at the end by the way you know very redeeming so hey yeah you know <laughs> Um, okay, we do have quite a few questions and I do want to get through them. I'm super excited. Um, so let's see here. Love your costume and virtual background. And it Thank you. Of, um, same, same. Um, <laughs> <laughs> your character's voices are so authentic. As a writer, how do you ensure authenticity of voices across genders? And what is your process like for that? I have no idea. Um, and that is <laughs> the like best truth. Like I, <laughs> what I do say when I teach workshops, when I am interacting with young writers is that it's important that you know how to listen. Um, a combination of listening and, and reading, mm. I think is what trained me with regard to writing voice. Um, I sit you guys are going to find out how big of a creep Nick Stone is. I will sit in whatever coffee shop I write in, which I haven't written in a coffee shop in two months. Ugh. I but mean, I will sit with my headphones on, looking like I'm working, but I'm actually just listening to the conversations no, around that's, me. Oh, that's creep. Next, next level. It is what it is. As, if you don't get caught, like, are you really a creep? Like, I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> if you don't get caught, then I'm not actually creeping on you. Like, I am, but you don't know it. So I'm not, I don't qualify as a creep. Anyway, I listen to these conversations because it gives you this really amazing opportunity to listen to how people tick. Where does the voice rise? Where do you find emotion, right? There was this one time I'm sitting in Starbucks. Just minding my own business, clearly not at all minding my own business, uh, listening <laughs> to these ladies at this table next to me. And at first the conversation was mad boring. Like they were talking about some like, one of them runs a nonprofit and the other one was asking her about a fundraiser. And I was like, this, okay, all right. And then out of nowhere, one of the women goes, oh, by the way, I got divorced a couple weeks ago. Whoa, whoa. And it was like conversation whiplash, but I tuned in and it got really interesting, right? But knowing, listening to way, like she started out super flat when she said that. It was just like this statement of fact, deadpan. 
And then the emotion started to come once she started talking about it. So it just gives me insight into how people tick, into how we think, how we move, how we process information. So then when I come to the page, I'm able to take those inflections and those nuances and I'm able to put them on the page in a way that it's, it's like me writing down what I'm hearing as opposed to me writing the way I was told I'm, I'm supposed to. Does that make sense? Like, it's like I'm hearing this stuff in my head and I'm literally just writing it down as I hear it instead of trying to make sure that the, uh, like, I, like, I don't really like uh, attributions. Like he said, she said, like, I like mm-hmm. when conversation flows yeah. on the page. Yeah. And when, I, when I'm hearing internal thought, I like to, for that internal thought to be kind of flowy as well. Um, but I will say, you do have to know the rules to break them. So like, mm-hmm. know your grammar and then know that you don't actually have to abide by those rules when you are trying to write um, voice. But to me, I think listening is like the first step, like actually listening and, and giving validation to the way people speak. Like there's no such thing as correct English. If I am speaking, mm-hmm. the whole point of language is communication. So if I'm yes. talking to you and you know what I'm saying, I have communicated effectively despite how I said it. Exactly. Um, so yeah, so that's, that was probably not helpful at all, but but that is the answer. No, I think you hit it on the, ne- on the, on the head, right? It's about authenticity and you were listening yeah. to authentic people, you know, yeah. real people. Yeah. You were creeping on them, but it was, you know, they're real. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. So um, I, I like that one a lot because it talks about the writing process. Mm-hmm. Um, and then let's see here. We talked a little bit about it, but was it really hard to describe a place that you have never been to, a place that is made up? Oh, 100%. I am the worst at world building. Anytime I turn in a book where there's like a fantasy component, first set of notes back needs more world building every single time because I don't know how, like I'm so used to writing in contemporary spaces where all I got to do is say he reached the side street. And like, boom, side street pops into your head. But when I'm like, Birninzana and the Typhon Gao, and and people are like, what what is happening? I don't know, what does the throne room look like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, It is, it's hard, um, but it's also, it has, it can be very fun. Um, The biggest struggle for me is like, I don't actually like tons and tons of words. Like I like to be succinct in my fiction. Um, but when you have to world build, you have to like write all this extra description. And I like, oh, yeah. Yeah. like, <laughs> well, it can slow oh a my pace God, down. I struggle through it. I so struggled through it. It can slow a pace down. Definitely. And it, yeah. like that's the kind of stuff that's like in high fantasy, you know? So when the kids ask for like, when they come into the library or when they, when they have come into the library, oh my God, you know, um, they would they would say they want high fantasy i'd be like well you know okay how do you want the pace to go Are you we know talking like tolkien or like right Riordan? like what right what do you mean do you like want to jump into the action or do you want to have this this tree talked about for like 10 pages because we could get you that you know <laughs> i'm good i'm real good i will say with world building i like i like using things that people are familiar with so there's a lot of metaphor. There's a lot of, um, mm-hmm. a lot of simile. There's a lot of figurative language. So like when I describe Shuri's travel vessel, it's the shape of a, of an, a panther mid leap. And that's all I said, like, boom, you have a picture in your head. That was great um, by the way. I love yeah, that. Like, I'm like, let me just try to keep it simple. We're not going to talk about the sleek lines and the aerodynamics. We don't have to get into all of that. If I say <laughs> panther mid leap, y'all got it. <laughs> um, well, okay. So another question is, since you're hinting there will be a few Shuri novels, um, you heard it here first, um, is, <laughs> is there any intention to integrate other Marvel characters? And uh, that's probably coming from a person who hasn't read the book just yet. <clears throat> um, no spoilers. Uh, Moon Girl, maybe. Hmm. Uh, look, all I'm going to say to this question, um, I love a good cameo. That's all I'm going to say. There is a solid one in this first Shuri book, if I do say so, so myself. I and when I tell I, you, I, I, had, <laughs> I had such a blast writing those scenes. So my brother, I have a brother. He is, he just turned 32. 
and you know he's reading this book about this 13 year old girl and he gets to this part where there's the reveal there's like <laughs> a, a cameo reveal and i get this text it's like bruh if this dot 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 <laughs> isn't natural i'm gonna flip and then he flips the page and he and i get this text that says bro <laughs> So yes, I do love cameos. Take that and run with it. So for the person who asked that question, definitely jump in and read the book because that cameo, I was, I, I also got on the phone, by the way, but I didn't wait like your brother. I, you know, I didn't wait to find out who, like, I didn't want to wait to find out who it was before I texted. I was like, oh my God. I, I, <laughs> so fun. Oh, so fun. Well, that's that's part and parcel of the Marvel universe, which is kind of cool because they all find the way to connect, you know. And yes. it was like almost a very seamless connection. I was just struck by how surprised I was. I was too because I was like, "Well, this does make sense." You know, it's why canon. Would- like it is. Ju- it's common canon too. Like I could I could pull up the panel where mm-hmm. where T'Challa is interacting with this character that makes a cameo in the first book. And when I found that out, when I found out that it was canon, I, I was like, oh, I'm good. Like, oh, we're done here. Like, this is absolutely <laughs> going to be so much fun to write. Um, and I was right, it was. The cameo, there's actually a couple of cameos. Let's see. Uh, four, there are four cameos uh, in, look, there's gonna, the second book comes out in February. Like we might as well stop hinting about it. Um, <laughs> uh, you heard it here, February. It comes out February 2nd, 2021. Oh. And, and there are some, there's some fun cameos in that one too. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, okay. So this one kind of relates. Are there other strong women in Wakanda whose stories you want to tell? Um, not in Wakanda necessarily. So there is a character in the Shuriverse, as I call it, because yes, she does get her own universe. Nice. There's a character in the Shuriverse that I created. Um, The one thing that bothered me in the film was Shuri's like utter and complete lack of friends. Um, I get it, right? Like you have like a two hour film, you can't do everything in two hours. But as a black girl who was like a science geek, having friends who understood me was like vital. Um, Or even not understood me, but just like having people who accepted me for who I was, was like a huge deal. So in the Shuriverse, she has a best friend named Kamara and Kamara is training, she's in training to become a Mm Dormelage. She's 13, like Shuri is, and they have the most ridiculous like bantery bickering like they're like an old married couple um, it's so good by the way. and I but I would love I, I told I would write stories about I would totally write stories about her mm-hmm. um there are definitely other people in the Marvel universe that I would love to write about we'll see what happens is all I'm gonna say there I mean you're hinting at sequels you know so hmm. <laughs> um okay so and then another question I did want to pull from the group was how were you selected to write this project can you tell us about the process so that us closet writers can emerge I have no idea how I was selected all I know is I got an email um, <laughs> so what's wild about this I saw Black Panther in theaters I left the theater and I'm like geeked. Like I left the theater while well, I was real mad when I left the theater. Cause there was one thing, one like particular plot line in the movie where I was like, it didn't even have to go like that. Like it could have, anyway, um, I left the theater and I was like, I have to say that Shuri character totally stole that whole movie. And I have oh, to yes. figure out a way. And I was telling my partner, I was like, I have to figure out a way that I can write a book about her. Like, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but Jason Reynolds did Miles Morales. There has to be a way that I can figure out how to write a book about her. That's all I said. About eight months later, I literally got an email that was like, hey, we're doing this new initiative and you were the person we thought of to take on this particular project. You spoke and out I, into the air. And I screamed in an airport and (laughs) people were alarmed. I was in Amarillo, Texas. I think I was like the only person with any melanin, probably in the entire (laughs) airport at that particular moment in time. Um, And I went "Ah!" in the airport and people were freaked out, but I didn't care because I mean, are you serious? There you go. 
There you go. What kind of forever? That's what that was. Forever. So what I will say is just like dream big. A lot Mm -hmm. of the things that have happened to me and for me in my writing career haven't really, like I wasn't in pursuit of them. And I know that's not necessarily helpful, but I think, I think that we don't do a good enough job of stressing how much of this stuff is like a giant crapshoot and like a bag of luck. Mm. Um, you can be the greatest writer in the world and you still need a ton of luck and like the right roll of the die. So keep pushing, keep chasing things. Um, Dear Martin, my debut was my third ever novel that I'd written. Um, the first one, like I said, is on Wattpad. <laughs> I, and then the second one, the second novel I ever wrote will come out in spring 2022. So like, don't quit basically. Like, so your second novel is coming you. out. Yeah. It your will. second is coming out after like, you know, yeah. after the years, debut. years after, I mean, it will be my fifth, my fifth YA. So like my second mm. novel I ever wrote will be my uh, six, tenth published novel. Wow. Yep. Congratulations. And so Thanks. prolific, you know? Uh, um, I don't know what I'm doing, but it's okay. <laughs> it's working out so far. And it's okay to take the time, you know, to, to figure it out. Much like Shuri did in, in the novel, you know, and she just kept trying. You know, there was a lot of resilience in her as yeah. she was navigating through that, you know? Yeah. Um, so we're getting an alert that it is time to start wrapping up. Sad. We just uh, I'm, started. I know. I'm pretty sad myself, actually. Um, but <laughs> one last really quick question. What's your favorite book and author and why? Oh, Lord. Why y'all do this to me? Okay. Favorite book is actually easy. Um, my favorite book is a book called The Virgin Suicides. The author's name is Jeff Eugenides, and it is very dark. Uh, it should definitely come with like a number of content warnings, but it <laughs> is a book um, that I read at a time when I really needed to. And I think there's something to be said about finding the right book at the right time. Yes. Um, it validated a lot of things that I was thinking and feeling, despite the fact that there are no people of color whatsoever. It, this is about, this is a book about five white sisters in a white, lily, lily, lily white town um, who are going through some things, but I was able to connect to kind of the emotional core of the story. And it moved me in a way that no book ever had before. Mm. Um, And yeah, and it's actually kind of weird, like to say aloud that my favorite book is one about a bunch of white girls, but I've come to a place where it helps me to understand the power of an emotional core of a story. Um, and it helps me to, it gives me this kind of launching off point to explain how books are vehicles of empathy mm-hmm. and how you can absolutely connect with somebody who is wildly different from you just by reading the right book. Uh, favorite author. Mm, I would, you know, I'm, I'm going to say Jason Reynolds. Um, And most people roll their eyes when I say that, but he is, I mean, he's, he's like an older brother to me. So I'm totally biased, (laughs) but I started, he's amazing. Right. And I started reading, I mean, I started reading his books when they first started the second round of when they first started coming out, which was like 2013, I think, um, when I was the greatest came out. Mm. But when I was trying to figure out, so this first novel I wrote that's on Wattpad, shot down left and right. I even got fired by my agent trying to sell that novel. Oh yeah, it was delightful. Uh, Get used to rejection, friends, if this is something you wanna do. Just a a pro tip there. There will be a lot of it and you gotta be okay with it and just kind of get up and keep going. So I pitched, so I, we parted ways. I wrote the second novel, the one that comes out in 2022 and it got me a new agent. But when she went out with that novel, she just couldn't, she couldn't place it. Um, there There was an editor who was asking if I was working on anything else. And I'd had the idea for Dear Martin kind of kicking around for a while, but I was really scared of trying to write a story like that. Mm -hmm. When I Was the Greatest, Jason Reynolds' um, kind of re-debut novel, there was this freedom that I 
got from reading that book and from seeing the way that he used language, from hearing the voices of the boys in that book, from seeing the things that he was willing to discuss in that book. So, and like every book since, like Jason is a person who continues to kind of push the envelope and who continues to kind of stretch what the, what children's literature actually means. Um, I've yet to read a book of his that I didn't like. I don't even have some that nobody else has. I'm pretty jealous because I'm also a big fan. So that's, that's, that's your end that I am jealous about. I mean, I had to buy, like, bought them on eBay. Like, I, I will not tell you how much I spent. So Jason Reynolds published a book called Self when he was much younger. Um, it's this beautiful book. There's, like, some poetry in it There's some, and some photography. And he and his buddy, they, like, paid to get it public. They paid to get it printed, et cetera, et cetera. And I will not tell you how much money I spent to get a copy of this dang book, but I'm glad that I did. It's like written out to some random family. Um, and I'm like, I'm glad you guys let this one go because now it's mine. It's yours now. And sometimes yes. you have to treat yourself. Treat yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I, I don't know if we're over time or out of time or I there. Oh, we're over time. Okay. We're done. Fantastic. So, Sorry, friend. um, Check out the book on Simply E. And thank you, Nick, so much for being here with us. That hardcover is beautiful. And until you can get your hands on it, um, Wakanda forever. Check it out on our ebook. Um, and thank you so much for, for being with us here today. Um, thank you for having me all the way from Wakanda, where there's all no the COVID-19. There you go. In my <laughs> dreams. As soon as I hang up, I'm going to have to go back to reality. And I'm, hmm. Keep the Zoom background up. Fine. Yeah, yeah it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess, folks, good night. Uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks and for tuning in. Thank you so much.